Hey guys, welcome back to Release the Crafting. Priscilla here with another episode of Storycraft. I hope you guys are excited because this is one that has been requested um, a couple of times. I'm not going to say a lot of times, but a couple of people. You know who you are. You asked for this story. Here it is. I'm going to tell you guys the story of Beauty and the Beast. And we got a lot of ground to cover because it turns out the original version of this is bonkers. So we're just going to jump into it. And, um... Barring my usual wrap-up, I think I'm still going to have some stuff to say at the end. But I want to start out with some, some fun little facts before we jump in here. Um, the roots, the origin of Beauty and the Beast can be traced back as far as 4,000 years. But that doesn't mean it's limited to 4,000 years ago. There's actually some evidence to uh, show that this story has been told forever. Because as we all know, it's a tale as old as time. So yeah, it's been around for a while. I'm going to be mostly working with the French version. There's a couple of different versions um, from like different countries around the world. Uh, I might do those versions later, but for right now, we're working in the French world. And um, I'm going to pull from a couple of different versions, mostly from like Villeneuve and Beaumont, whose like adaptations came out in the 1740s and 1856. That can't be right. That has to be a typo. I think it's 1756, guys. Because um, it was only a couple years after Villeneuve. And Beaumont is not immortal. Um, so yeah, that was a typo in my notes. Uh, which I wrote by hand. So, yay, dyslexia. Uh, but there's an earlier version adapted by Perrault in 1697 called La Belle Roule La Bette. And I am not French. Uh, I have no training in French, so don't come at me. That was good enough for the purposes intended here. <laughs> um, but sort of these versions and then the version by Andrew Lang, which did come out in the 1800s, um, those like form the basis of the general idea of the predominant Beauty and the Beast story that we know today. And these are where like the Disney movies pulled their inspiration from. So that's what I'm working with. You guys are going to be interested to see the differences, I think, between this version and Disney's version, if you're familiar with those. Um, and it's definitely going to be way different than the Once Upon a Time version, because in that version, they have uh, Rumpelstiltskin being the Beast as well, which is great, because I love that show. But it's sort of a strange take on it, so they didn't pull from the same source, clearly. But at any rate, I have rambled. I know you guys are eager, so let's get into it. So our story begins in the way long ago, but not like in the super long ago, just like longer than I care to recall. Um, there was a wealthy merchant who had six sons and six daughters. So wealthy he could have 12 kids because that's ridiculous. Um, I don't recall any version where they talk about Belle's mom being present in the picture. So this guy's like a single father of 12 children working as a merchant, taking care of everyone. Um, he uses his wealth to make sure that all of his children, regardless of their gender, which progressive, um, are super well educated and well read. Which of course, I guess you can see where they all get their love of reading, especially the youngest, who was so beautiful that everyone calls her Belle, which is the French word for beauty. Um, we never get her real name. So, you know, chew on the complex that she must have got where her original birth name is totally replaced by a nickname given to her solely based on her appearance, which is not great. But that it is what it is. Everyone calls her Belle. I'm going to be calling her Belle for the duration of this because I don't know what her original name is. It could have been like Matilda, which is a cool name. But she, we don't know. We'll never know because they didn't care. They only cared about her name from her appearance. So not great, but not the worst thing. Like not the worst childhood nickname you could get. It could have been like Stinky Pete or something awful. <laughs> At any rate, um, things are going great. You know, they're living the high life. All the children are being taken care of. Um, it's never really mentioned how old Belle is in the story, but it's presumed generally that she's of a marrying age, which means all these kids are 
old as shit, but they still live with their dad. No, no judgment. Economies are, are tough. Capitalism sucks. So everything's going great up until the moment capitalism super sucks because Basically, overnight, the family's entire fortune is lost when the father's merchant ships are all lost out at sea during a terrible storm and never return to make port. So, like, all of a sudden, the dad has to take his 12 children, downsize them into a teeny tiny house um, way out in the country because they can't afford to live in the city anymore. Like, I guess he invested all of his coins into this one thing, which, not a great move, but I guess it had been working for a while, so... Again, no judgment. I can't invest in anything, so I don't really have room to speak. Um, but now all these kids, <laughs> these 12 children are being forced to live in a tiny house, and they have to do work, you guys, and chores. And it's awful. I mean, can you imagine anything more horrifying than having to work for a living and take care of your house and home? Because I don't have any servants anymore. It's just, I can't relate. Um... All of them are actually super upset about this, especially Belle's sisters. Like, they're the most vocal about it and tend to refuse to work so much that they just sort of leave all the work for Belle to do, all the women's work, quote unquote. You can hear it in my voice, I hope. Um, but the super cool thing about Belle was that she didn't actually care. <laughs> um, she enjoyed living a quiet, humble life. And doing the housework was, like, a place where she could just find her zen and chill out. Um, so much so that, like, she used to disgust her sisters with how cheery she was doing the housework. Like, she's just bopping around, singing, dancing with the broom. And they were like, this fucking bitch. Like, could you be miserable like the rest of us? There's never anything directly said about how her brothers are handling it. I'm guessing because they're not at home. They all have to go work. Um, but they probably come home and bitch about it over dinner. Like, nobody's happy. Not even the dad. Um, except for Belle. Belle's like, I see no problems here. This is great. Now I can like fuck off and muck out the stable while you guys just leave me this shit alone because her sisters suck, you guys. They really suck. Um, not enough can be said about how much they suck. They're super vapid and shallow and they basically pick on her because they're so jealous of how pretty she is and because nobody gave them nicknames based on their appearance, which again, you're lucky because it could be like Wardy Wilma and that's awful. That's awful. Nobody wants that. Nobody wants that. Um... So, you know, they live this way for about a year and then the father gets word that some of his ships might have actually survived and they're about to make port. So he gets all of his stuff together, gathers up his children and plans to go back um, to the city to reclaim his family's lost fortune. But before he goes, he tells his kids like, hey, we're going to be rich again. So tell me what you want as gifts. And they all ask for like expensive jewelry, dresses, fancy new clothes and super luxury items like they want brand name, label everything, right? And when he gets down the line, with this like million dollar price tag gift list, he gets to Belle and he's like, what would you like? And she's like, I just want your safe return, Papa. And he's like, well, that's a given, uh, but actually ask for something because I can't come back with all this fancy shit for your brothers and sisters. Like, you got to get something, at least get a dress. All your sisters wanted a new dress. And she's like, no, all I want is your safe return. And so they bully her um, or, you know, they they continuously question her until she wears down with her like chill. I don't want stuff lifestyle. And she's like, OK, fine, fine. If I have to get something, I would like you to pick me out a single rose, the most beautiful rose you see on your journey. Just pick a rose and bring it back to me. And the dad's like, that's not something I can buy like you can get roses everywhere it's France uh but I guess if at least you're getting something you, you can't be upset when all your sisters have cool things and you have a rose and she's like I really won't because I didn't want shit in the first place so the dad leaves and he makes it all the way back to the city only to find out that um it wasn't his ships that made it back so he has to go home in shame because he doesn't have any money. So he can't buy his children all these super expensive gifts. And um, he talked a big talk before, you know, maybe making sure that he had like ships to have goods to sell. Because like it's been a year, dude. Like I don't understand what he was expecting to happen. Like he'd just show up and there'd be all these ships. 
with all of his money on it still intact. Like nobody stole any of his goods over the course of a year. I don't know. The logic wasn't logicking, but he went with it. Again, the man is bad at investments. Trains of logic might not be his his best suit. He's just a really good dad. Maybe. Um, so he has to go back to the like home. And on the way back, this storm kicks up and delays his travels. And then he ends up lost and separated from his horse. And horse. Oh, my gosh. If I edited these, you guys, like. I should, but I'm not going to. He gets separated from his horse and finds himself like in the deep dark wood and he wanders up and there's this seemingly abandoned castle, but it's beautifully maintained. It's pristine condition. The garden is immaculate. The walls are perfect. Everything looks like, imagine a fairy tale castle. This is a fairy tale. Put those, those concepts together because they're not separate at all. This is what he walks up to and he's like, there's nobody here, but this is the prettiest place I've ever freaking seen. It's really super cold. I'm wet and upset. I'm going to go up to this castle and see if I can like take shelter for the night. So, you know, he goes up to the door. It's unlocked. There's nobody standing around guarding the door. He walks right inside. I don't know how long he spent knocking. I don't even think he knocked, honestly. You'll see why I don't think he knocked in a second. Um... But when he's like walking through the castle, it seems to be super abandoned, except that all the lights are on. It's warm and he can smell the scent of like freshly made food, which reminds him how hungry he is. So he's like, oh, my God, I'm starving. It's so nice in here. Um, but I don't see anybody. There's no life in this castle. It's just. It's just full of all the amenities with no people. So as he wanders through, he finds a huge hearth and a fireplace. He runs right to it to warm up and chills there for a little bit, warming up, drying off a bit. And then he's like, you know what? I am starving. I, I could eat and I can smell the food. So I know it's here. So he heads off and he finds the dining room and there's this huge meal set out for him already. And he assumes it's for him because he hasn't seen anybody else. Not like it could be for anybody else, like the person who cooked it, but, you know, no judgment. The man has no questions. <laughs> no questions. Food is obviously for him. Um, so he digs in, you know, just helps himself, has this great dinner. And the entire time he's wondering, like, where are the castle servants? Because he hasn't heard them make a whisper, not even like a footfall, nothing the entire time he's been there. And so he starts to loudly make his presence known, um, calling out like, hey, is anybody here? Is the owner of the castle here? Sorry, I just barged in, but I am starving. I am cold. I am poor still. <laughs> so could you like take pity on me? And if you want, I can pay you for the food. I just need a place to stay tonight. Um, I don't know how he was going to pay for the food because the man is broke, but doesn't matter. Nobody answers him. So he continues to uh, tuck in and enjoy himself. And he literally asks no questions. He's not like, hey, who brought the food here? Is this safe to eat? Nothing. Um, which makes me think that he's like a relative of the, the giant's maid in Jack and the Beanstalk because she also had no questions. So like this man sees this castle fully set out for him and he's like, mm, I'm going to help myself to everything. <laughs> No questions. It's just invisible people, obviously. Not weird at all. No suspicions. And, uh, yeah, basically, that is the assumption that he, he works on the entire time he's there. He just assumes the castle has an invisible owner who has cooked for him and warmed up the fire for him and all these things. And he uh, finds a nice cozy chair by the fire and just takes a nap and ends up sleeping the entire night. And he sleeps entirely undisturbed. Wakes up in the morning to find a full breakfast and some hot chocolate and just has his fill, drinks up his little warm chocolate and he's like, mm, I feel great. Thank you so much for your hospitality. And then he dips. And as he's walking back down, you know, the castle way, he's like, look at this beautiful garden all around me. I'm going to take a stroll through this. I'm going to take the scenic route out of the castle so I can consider what I'm going to tell my children when I get home. Um... And again, the man got lost in the woods, doesn't know where to go, but has zero questions or concerns. He's just going to meander in the garden. And while he's walking through the garden, regretting his fortunes, trying to think of good excuses for his selfish, greedy children, um, he sees all the roses in the garden. He's like, oh, <laughs> I can get Belle her rose in the least 
because clearly she's my favorite child because she was the only person whose gift I was super concerned about. The only person I'm going to bring a gift back. And I'm not going to think about how weird it would be if I show up empty handed for the rest of my 11 children and I just bring the one her present. Not weird. Um, so he grabs up this rose thinking, you know, at least he can do this one thing right. Um, and his 12 children, his 12 grown ass children won't be disappointed. Again, they're, they're over marrying age. You guys, I can't stress that enough. These are adults. He's like, Oh no, I don't want to disappoint my kids. Kick them out. <laughs> Don't kick them out. Be a, be a good dad. I don't know. I'm torn. I'm torn. Um, probably because they're greedy. Kick them. Kick those little shits out. But anyways, <laughs> as soon as he plucks the rose, um, the true owner of the castle, who you guys, I don't know if you know, wasn't actually invisible, uh, leaps out um, from behind the bushes, which is creepy and questionable like were you just waiting for this man to fuck up i don't know clearly he was um he jumps out it is a huge towering beast man like beast features pig snout like warthoggy face a uh, lion's mane a tail like just, you guys know what the beast looks like imagine the beast but like scarier because this is the real version um so he jumps out and he actually like assaults our merchant dad and is like how dare you steal from me and take advantage of all the hospitality i've shown you i gave you food shelter and then you steal from me like what the shit and so the dad starts like begging for his life and then you know in true anxious king fashion he's like let me just tell you my entire life story so he does he lays out his whole situation to the beast and then tries to like beg him like hey i'm so sorry but i just wanted to get this as a gift for my youngest and loveliest daughter he adds that in there that's how you know she's the favorite guys um and you know as he's telling the story the beast doesn't interrupt him at all he listens very kindly and patiently which is more than he had to do more than the guy deserved for being a like a thief and he's like he listens to the whole thing and then he tells them, all right, um, I'm going to punish you because you stole a rose from me, a rose from my prize rose bushes, which would elude me to like think or lead me to think that the beast grew the roses himself because he's clearly very proud of them. Um, so the beast, master gardener, flower dude, we love to see it um he tells him i'm gonna punish you um by trapping you here in this castle unless and just i'm, gonna, I'm just gonna throw this out here guys um unless you get one of your daughters to trade places with you and now hear me out um there's some rules here because you can't uh trick your daughter into trading places with you she has to willingly give up her freedom um and you have to tell her the full story you can't like manipulate her into coming here. She needs to know why you're getting punished and why she's trading places with you and what the situation is. And the father's like, oh, and I, I would I would stay, but like I have 12 children to take care of. Like, I don't know what to do. So the beast is like, don't even worry. Take this chest. It's full of gold and all the gifts your kids asked for and take this back home so that, you know, your family will have enough money and the presents from you. Um... So that they don't have to suffer while you're gone because you're going to come back and face your punishment, which like side note, guys, like I don't know what he was expecting, because if someone was like, here, take everything you told me you were in need of and then uh, take it home, but then also come back so I can lock you away forever. I'd be like, sure, sure. We're leaving the country, guys. We're leaving the country. Um, I have a chest full of gold. We're leaving the country. Um, <laughs> but the merchant dad doesn't do that. He's just like. Well, shoot, I, I guess I'll, I'll, I'll do that. That's really generous of you. So the beast uh, brings him a horse and saddles him up and sends him on his way back home. So when the father gets home, he has this chest full of riches and he decides, you know what? Before I show this to my kids, I'm going to put this to the side for a little while um, and just get the reaction based on my story to see what we're going to do here. So he hides the chest for a little bit and 
Uh, he tells the tale to this whole family and Belle listens to this story and she starts to weep because she feels so responsible because it was her request for the rose that led to her father's plight um, and not his little grabby fingers and his inability to just ask for something. Um, so she announces that she's going to take her father's place. This leads to a big argument because her dad is like, no, 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 you can't do that. And then her brothers are like, let's just go kill the beast instead of sending you back there. Um, which is a really reasonable idea when you think about it, like realistically, if you kill the beast and you don't have the problem, plus it's a beast. So like, yeah, but this is a fairy tale. So clearly it doesn't happen. Um, they can't talk her out of it. She demands to go. And so they have to just pack her up and send her back on the horse back to the beast castle. And um, as she's leaving, she tells her dad, like, hey, I'm really going to miss you most. Like, you've been so kind to me and so good to me. Don't feel guilty about me having to go. This wasn't your fault at all. It totally was. Um, but, you know, like, I just want you to remember me fondly. And her dad's like, oh, my God, I, I'm i going to tell you this because it's just the two of us here. Like, he gave me all this money and stuff. So it's, it's basically like I'm selling you to him in exchange for all these things. And she's like, you're not selling me because I chose to go. Also, maybe don't show my brothers and sisters this until you get them all married off. Because they really just need to be married off so that they can live comfortably. And then you can use the money from that chest wisely to rebuild your business and secure a future for everybody and the dad's like that's really wise and good advice this is why you're my favorite and she's like what and he's like nothing I didn't say anything so and they pack her up on a horse and they send her back to the palace and um all of her family is out there to like wave her goodbye and her sisters are like so selfish and cold-hearted towards her because you know remember they hate her for being pretty um and probably just not because she's pretty but because everybody else knows she's pretty again they named her Belle um so they can't even cry but every time their dad looks over at them they rub onions under their eyes so that they can be like oh we're so sad um so they can pretend to be sad as she's leaving because they don't they don't care they're happy to see her go um so she makes it back to the castle safely um, and is welcomed uh, by the beast himself. He's the only person there. And when she shows up and, you know, pulls up to the door, this huge firework display goes off that apparently he organized to, like, welcome her there. And then, uh, you know, he tells her, like, graciously, thank you for coming to join me. And I'm so happy that you're here. Um... And he just welcomes her in the castle, shows her around. She gets a nice room, not the dungeon that she was expecting to be left in. And he just leaves her alone for the rest of the night. He's like, get some rest. You're, you're here now. This is it. Here's our pad. Here's my crib. Like, here's all my things. And, um, you know, she goes to bed. And during that night, she dreams of a woman who tells her she's going to be rewarded for her sacrifice. So, like, to keep her heart, you know, and her spirits high. Because she's going to get a reward for being such a good kid and coming here in exchange for her dad. And over the next couple months, um, Belle has a grand old time, you guys. Like, she has the full run of the castle. Nowhere is restricted. Uh, she spends most of her time in the huge library and among the roses that, like, determined her fate. Um, because she's a bookworm. Thanks, Dad. That was a really great thing you did. Um, so that's where she spends most of her time. She uh, never sees a servant while she's there, like, in all the hours she's there, she never sees a servant. But um, an invisible orchestra plays for her while she has her meals. And her room and her clothes are always cleaned and maintained. So it sort of alludes to like a huge host of magical servants being present. So she's basically living in the lap of luxury without having to do any chores. Um, having a grand old time. But she starts to feel like a little bit lonely. And... While she's like perusing the library, she finds this magical book. And on the first page of the book, it tells her to whisk what she... Blah, blah, blah. God, so tongue-tied. It's going to be a day. <laughs> she finds on the first page of the book that it tells her to wish what she'd like. And she'll get what she wishes because she's the queen there. Like she has full dominion of this place. So she wishes to see her family. And in a magical mirror, she ends up seeing her father... And everything looks pretty chill. Um, so she's like, okay, great. And she just goes about her business. 
with this super magical book she doesn't make a bunch of wishes off of um because remember she's not greedy like the rest of us because I would have wished for fucking everything in that castle it had to be so boring um she doesn't <laughs> she's a good kid so um at the end of her days like every single day um she spends her evenings in the parlor like just chatting with the beast and they have um all sorts of conversations they talk about everything and during the course of their conversations she learns that the beast is really well spoken he's super polite he's even really gentle in his manner towards her he never lashes out at her he never gets angry with her they end up having like really deep conversations really nice like polite debates and she's just like wow this guy is cool uh too bad he's a super scary beast um and like during the course of these conversations he always finishes up the the talks that they have by asking her to sleep with him um and not just like sleep with him but like sleep with him sleep with him every day he's like will you, you want to sleep with me now and she's like no <laughs> and she's always worried that like when she rejects him he'll get angry because um as women for my women people in this uh, audience I think you know why um but she's worried that he'll get like super mad when she rejects him and he's like no nah, no big deal I'm gonna keep asking you though <laughs> which he does he asks her every day but whenever she refuses he keeps telling her don't worry I'm gonna be super nice to you you have nothing to fear from me um which like plus 10,000 for consent because even though he's like persistent and wearing her down which is not great um we stand a consent king so he doesn't want to take any advantage of her and he doesn't press her after she says no he just tells her I'm gonna ask you again tomorrow um and over the course of three months they have this like routine this ritual they get closer and closer but she continues to reject all of his proposals to uh spend the night casually with him um some versions of this just as an aside um he doesn't ask her to sleep with him he asks her to get married um that's not as interesting <laughs> so he, he wants to smash and he asks her every night and she's like nah bro and they keep doing this for a while um but over this time you know she has this regular routine she settled into a part of this routine is that uh every night when she goes to sleep she dreams of this gorgeous beautiful like fairy tale prince of a man um and he never speaks to her they never interact but all the dreams are capped off with uh the same woman who appeared to her on the first night um a fairy by this point we've realized um who tells her don't be fooled by appearances which you know depending on where you're looking at this from is like super ominous I think you know if someone's just like don't be fooled by appearances here's this gorgeous guy you're dreaming about don't be fooled by this face like I would put those two together that's how my brain works um but it's kind of like a giant billboard sign that this fairy is giving her like could you pay attention don't be fooled by appearances look at this gorgeous man and Belle doesn't get a picture because she's clever but she's, she's not that clever um I don't, I don't know how she misses this but this is just how her, her life goes and she's you know she's fine with it like who would be mad about having to see a gorgeous man every time you close your eyes I, I can't think of a single person um but one day Belle's like man I just really miss my family and I want to see my dad again and she you know she picks up the wishing book she wishes for it again and in the mirror she sees her dad and he looks super sad really gaunt and ill and he's like bereft and he's just lamenting at the loss of Belle because she's his favorite <laughs> um and she's like oh man this is depressing because her dad is like underneath the impression that she's like suffering in the prison of the castle like at the bottom of this like mossy gross pit um and instead of using the wishing book to be like hey dad I'm okay like I'm just gonna shoot you this mirror message real quick she doesn't do anything she um actually goes back to the beast and she's like hey um I know that I'm supposed to stay here forever that's like the punishment I'm serving um but could I just see my family for like a week so I can let them know that I'm okay because I'm worried my dad's gonna die from missing me um, and the beast is like, well, your dad's not going to die from missing you, but I will. 
fucking dramatic. Um, but he decides, you know, to agree and consent and relent and let her go. So he gives her a magical ring of teleportation plus five mana for like my nerds in the audience. Um, and she finds herself suddenly in her old room and we're supposed to believe that none of her 11 other siblings ever took her room or trashed it or did anything with it. And she finds all these trunks of jewels and sparkling bejeweled dresses and they appear there as a gift from the beast. And she wants to give some to her sisters because she's a good kid, but they all disappear the second she has that thought because even the beast was like, fuck your sisters. Um... And she's like, oh, well, uh, that sucks. So she goes back into the house and she tells her family, you know, the entirety of her experiences living with the beast. And um, she's super happy to be back with them. She's enjoying her time. Her sisters are hearing um, all of this and they are fucking jealous as hell. They are so mad that she's having a great time living in a castle, practically a princess, while they're stuck in this little tiny house with all the other boys and their dad, which like gonna add, none of them got married in the time she was gone. So like you had one job dad and you, you didn't do it. Belle gave you the playbook and she didn't do it. And because uh, dad didn't do it, uh, all the sisters decide that they are going to work together to keep her there past her allotted week so that um, the beast will die of depression. Um, so they distract her by giving her all the housework that they didn't want to do, all the chores and stuff, and then just crying to her about all their problems in life, like, oh, I don't have any fancy clothes anymore. These are last season. Um, and then they decide to, like, flip the script and treat her really nicely. So she's like, wow, this is really great. So she's like, okay, I'll stay for a couple extra days. So she stays for three extra days, and then her brothers are like, well, we don't want you to leave either excuse me, we don't want you to leave either. So uh, first they start to argue her down, which takes a couple of days for her to be like, no, nah, I really have to go. Um, and then they start telling her how much they love her. And she's like, that's so sweet, guys. And then eventually they get the bright idea to hide away her little magical ring so she can't go back home. And then they all keep her distracted and busy. So she ends up staying an entire week longer than she intended to. Um, and on the 14th night, she has this dream. And this time it's of the beast laying in the rose garden and he is dying of grief. And she wakes up and she's in a panic and she's like, oh my God, I've been away far too long. Um, she searches the house until she finds the magic ring, which apparently was not very well hidden because she found it pretty quickly. And she teleports back to the castle. And because she's related to her father, <laughs> she has no urgency, <laughs> no question. She doesn't run around looking for him. She gets all dressed up, gets herself extra pretty, puts on her finest clothes, and she just waits in the parlor for the beast to meet her there um, for their nightly chat. And hours later, when he doesn't show up, she's like, oh yeah, my dream. Like, girl, what are you doing? <laughs> You woke up because of this dream. But at any rate, again, she's clever, but she's not that clever. She uh, runs all over the castle to try to find him, calling out to him all the halls, all the rooms, and she can't find him. And eventually she's like, my dream was in the garden. And so she runs out to the garden and there she finds the beast like on the verge of death, laying out there um, underneath the roses, the same rose bush that her dad plucked the rose from. Um basically almost dead um she could have started there in the very least she does not um so she runs and she gets him some water which revives him a little bit and he tells her um you forgot me and you forgot our promise and you said you would come back but you didn't and like you know um he's like because you didn't come back um i was just gonna lay here in the garden and starve myself to death again dramatic um, but honestly, I'm here for it. Uh, and he's like, well, I'm so happy now. I'm going to die happy because you finally returned to me. I got to see your beautiful face again. And she's like, um, actually you can't die because you're going to be my husband. Um, because I realized when I thought I had lost you that I was actually in love with you. And a bunch of things happen all at the same time, you guys. So like the fireworks start going off. Like I don't, they're just fireworks on standby in this place and the beast disappears and he's replaced by the prince from her dreams obviously <laughs> and he starts to tell her like rapid fire like i'm the beast and this wicked fairy changed me into a beast until a woman agreed to marry me 
And um, he, he said that like the stipulations of the curse was that he couldn't tell um, anybody about the curse, but he also couldn't trick people into marrying him, which is why the whole consent aspect was so important. She had to willingly want to be there and willingly want to marry him. He couldn't con her into it or anything. And then, um, you know, while she's trying to like process all this, the fairy woman from her dreams appears and tells her that like, hey, I am a fairy. And she waves her hand and Belle's family all shows up and they all like start celebrating because I guess she told them on the way. I don't know. Apparently all of her siblings were happy for her, um, except for her sisters, who again, were like, why does she get everything? And the fairy was like, you know what? I'm actually sick of you guys. You guys suck. You suck so much. You almost killed this guy because you wanted to be little like petty bitches about it. So she waves her hand and all of her sisters turn into stone, but their consciousness is intact. So they're awake inside of these stone statues that their bodies have become, which is fucking terrifying and the fairy is like really nonchalant about this and she's like don't worry they're gonna stay like this and until they can um admit all of their faults um so forever more they're going to get to watch you and the prince be happy together um until they can fucking get over themselves and just admit how ugly of people they are and she's pretty confident that they're going to be statues forever because they're so freaking horrendous and now their outsides match their inside like cold stone-like hearts because remember they didn't even care about Belle they couldn't even cry when she left um and then you know before Belle can process that um this carriage shows up it's made of gold a queen steps out of it and she's like hey I happen to be the prince's mother um I was unable to return while my son was cursed but now he's cured so I'm back and then she goes on to explain that the reason her son was cursed in the first place was that he rejected the advances of this evil fairy like you know her we all know her that evil fairy he was like nah girl I don't want that and that girl was like cool 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 I'm gonna curse you so that you're a beast and nobody will ever want to be with you until you agree to be with me and the only way you can break it is if somebody wants to be with you but I made you butt ass ugly so no one's gonna want you so you'll have to be with me and um there was nothing the queen could do about this curse because she was away fighting war so shout out to the warrior queen that's pretty badass um except she's not that cool so hold your horses before you start singing her praises because she goes off to say like she's super happy that her son is back to normal but um he can't marry Belle because she's a fucking commoner she's a petty little commoner and that's not gonna work he's a prince so clearly he's too good for her and her poor like genes and the dream fairy who's like hey wait hold up before you reject Belle outright um I'm actually her aunt um, and Belle isn't uh, actually the daughter of this dude here. He just raised her. Um, she's actually the daughter of the fairy king, which like, you guys, what a plot convenience. Um, and so now there's nothing in their way because Belle's clearly royalty because this lady said so. And uh, they get married. They live the rest of their days happily ever after. Um, eventually, the dad marries off the sons and they kind of just live their happy lives. Uh, now Belle is going to be queen next because she's half fairy and nobody ever brings up how Belle's mom slept with the fairy king. Or how she got there? Like, no no questions. This is a family of no questions. The dad wasn't even like, oh no, my favorite child is not actually my child. He was just like, great, get married. What wonderful news. Nobody asked any questions here. Um, And that's it. You guys, that's the end of the story. They all live happily ever after. The end. Uh, there were fairies in this. Did you know there were fairies in this? There were fairies in this the entire time. Also, they never really mentioned like, where the palace servants were. I'm guessing they were all the way to war and now that the queen is back, they can all come back. And so maybe it was just fairies doing all the housework. We don't know. We don't ask questions. We're also related to the maid from Jack and the Beanstalk. Uh, and yeah, that's it, you guys. That's Beauty and the Beast. Uh, again, my version is a couple of the other versions smashed together, but that's the general idea. It's pretty crazy. I actually love the Beast in this one because he's not like, a raging psychopathic narcissist um no hate or shame except for a little bit of hate and shame to the disney version i love that movie though so i'm not mad at it he he comes around we love a redemption arc but in this story he's like just super chill he just happens to look like a beast and he's just like yeah <laughs> this is my face i got it because i didn't want to sleep with that girl 
kind of fucked up of her. <laughs> She's the true villain here, but I'm just going to continue to ask you to sleep with me um, until you realize when you've lost me what a treasure I am. And um, as a Leo, I understand that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that's Beauty and the Beast. Um, there's like a bunch of different versions of this. I don't think, well, probably, maybe. There's some elderly type people here who will remember uh, Ron Perlman as the Beast in the TV show. It was like a live action TV show. Um, I only remember that like through, I guess, like a core memory I have of watching it with my mom at one point because she really loved that show. But then, like, it was too scary for me, so I couldn't watch it because I was a wee little child when it came out. Um, but I'm also old. And that's also really dating. Um, and then there's, like, a version in, I believe, in Shelley Duvall's, like, fairy tale theater. If not Shelley Duvall's version, there's a Muppets, like, Jim Henson version where there's a Beauty and the Beast tale. And it's really good. I'd recommend those. Those as fun things to follow up with. And, um, yeah, there's lots of versions of this story. So I think eventually at some point I will get to some other versions, especially the ones from other countries. Because they have slightly different takes to them and they're pretty interesting. But I really enjoy this story. It's one of my favorites. Um, so I was happy to share it with you guys. Thank you for the request. And if you made it to the end of this video, I appreciate your faces. Um, if you have any requests for me, stories that you would like to see in an upcoming story craft, I'll let me know. But until next time, guys, uh, happy crafting. Bye.